Archaeology is a field of study that comes without guarantees. The largest object you ever find could tell you almost nothing worthwhile about the distant past. On the other hand, the smallest of objects might tell you everything about the people who created them. Archaeologists never know what to expect when they go looking for artifacts, but they know there are wonderful discoveries out there to be made if they keep their eyes peeled. Here are just a few of those discoveries. Charlemagne, the ancient king of the Franks, is one of the most storied and legendary figures in all of history. So much has been written about the great leader that it's difficult to know what's true and what's not. The confusion even extends to the talisman of Charlemagne, which is presented as an artifact that once belonged to the king, even though the connection cannot be proven. It's also said that the talisman contains a piece of the true cross, the crucifix to which Jesus Christ was nailed. Whether this object belonged to Charlemagne or not, it's a stunning Carolingian reliquary medallion and would be worthy of note even without the royal connection. It can be proven that it comes from the 9th century, so the timeline just about fits the story. Some stories say that there was once a strand of the Virgin Mary's hair next to the wooden fragments inside the piece, but that the hair was lost when two sapphires were taken out to be replaced with enamel glass in 1804. No record of the talisman's whereabouts prior to 1620 exists, but at the time it was said to have been found inside the tomb of Charlemagne by Emperor Frederick Barbarossa in 1166. The seal of Wolfric isn't as beautiful as the talisman of Charlemagne, but it's no less significant or mysterious. Like the talisman, the tale of its discovery is strange. It was found inside a box in a garden shed in Sittingbourne, Kent, England during a house clearance in 1976. Despite being found in such an unlikely place, it's a rare and genuine Anglo-Saxon seal matrix that predates the Norman conquest of 1066. Only five seal matrixes from this era have ever been found, and this is one of only three that's made from walrus ivory. Archaeologists think it was made somewhere between 1040 and 1050. The Anglo-Saxon inscription around its edges clearly identifies it as the seal of Wolfric, but Wolfric's identity remains unknown. He might have been the bearded man whose portrait is carved into the center of the artifact. The figure is shown with a sword, which means he was probably a secular figure and might have been a senior minister to the King of England. He was not, however, a king, and his name doesn't turn up in any historical records from the time. Still, someone thought enough of him to wear his seal as a pendant around their neck. Perhaps it was Wolfric himself. When you apply gold gilding to any object, you instantly make it more valuable and ostentatious. When our ancient ancestors applied gold plating to their clothing or accessories, they generally did so to make themselves appear more important. With that in mind, we can only assume that the owner of these gilt bronze shoes had a very high opinion of themselves. The shoes were found during the excavation of a chamber tomb in Naju, South Korea in October 2014. The identity of the tomb's occupant is unknown, but he lived during the Bakje Kingdom period and was laid to rest during the 7th century. Aside from being gold-plated, the shoes are decorated with dragon, lotus, and goblin designs. They're wonderful to look at, but must surely have been impractical to wear. Historians haven't ruled out the possibility that they were created specifically for the burial. Other grave goods found inside the same tomb include earrings, ceramics, stone pillows, a harness, and arrowheads. It's clear that this must have been a person of great importance, so it's frustrating that nothing with an inscription that might identify them was left behind before the tomb was sealed. Archaeologists in France hit the jackpot in August 2021 when two separate deposits of fantastic Bronze Age ritual hoards were discovered in the department of Allier. The collections were carefully curated before being buried and included items never before seen in deposits of this kind. One excited researcher even declared them to be the first in the history of European archaeology. 
Excavations have been ongoing in this area since 2019, when archaeologist Pierre-Yves Milson identified the first signs of an ancient Bronze Age settlement in the region. It's thought that the discoveries are around 2,800 years old. Among the finds are spearheads, daggers, harnesses, chariot parts, sickles, knives, and axes. There are hundreds of individual artifacts across two deposits, though, and most of them are items of jewelry like pendants, ankle rings, bracelets, and elaborately decorated belts. Each deposit was arranged the same way with jewelry at the bottom and axe blades at the top. Hundreds of smooth pebbles seemingly chosen for their color create layers between one type of object and another. This pattern has never been observed before, and experts aren't sure what it means. Before the invention of gunpowder, the most efficient way to knock down a castle wall was by using a trebuchet to fire stone artillery balls at it. The citizens of Edinburgh, Scotland, knew all about that in the 13th century when their city came under attack from the forces of King Edward I of England. Attacking his Scottish neighbors was a particular preoccupation of the king, who was nicknamed the Hammer of the Scots. Here's one of the artillery balls that his men left behind. It was found in the grass market area of Edinburgh during an archaeological excavation ahead of the construction of a new hotel in January 2019. This part of Edinburgh is in a hollow beneath the ancient castle, so it's not surprising that a few stray trebuchet balls might have ended up here. It's likely that it was fired at the walls during the Siege of Edinburgh in 1296. The siege was successful, resulting in the king capturing Edinburgh Castle and holding on to it for 18 years during which time the English stole the Stone of Destiny. It's not a fond cultural memory for the Scots, but the trebuchet ball has found its way into a Scottish museum nonetheless. The spoon is the most basic item of cutlery we can imagine, but someone still had to invent it. As far as archaeologists are aware, the spoon was invented around 4,000 years ago, either in Egypt or China, with the possibility that it was separately invented in both places at about the same time. About 200 years after that, the ancient Mongolians started making spoons out of bone. And in January 2020, some of those ancient bone spoons were found by archaeologists. The discovery of the spoons took place at the same time as the discovery of a 7,500-year-old bone knife at the bottom of the Egg River in Bogum Aymad which serves to illustrate how big the gap between the invention of the knife and the invention of the spoon is. It's thought that the necessity of the spoon's invention is connected to changing dietary practices during the Neolithic era, which saw our ancestors move away from eating their food raw and instead begin to cook and prepare their meals more thoroughly. Bone is a strange choice of material considering that stone and wood was available but it was no less efficient as a utensil. These days, we associate crayons with children. We give the drawing tools to our offspring to create and color in pictures long before we trust them with paint or ink. Thousands of years ago, though, there was nothing childish about the use of crayons. In fact, the people of the Stone Age used a primitive type of crayon to color in animal skins about 10,000 years ago. This crayon was found at the English archaeological site of Star Car, Yorkshire, during the 1980s, but wasn't properly studied until archaeologist Andy Needham did so in early 2018. It was he who demonstrated that the reddish-brown artifact would have made for an effective crayon. The artifact is fashioned from the natural clay earth pigment called ochre and has a pointed end to make it easier to create markings. This part of Yorkshire is known for its ancient artwork and similar crayons may well have been used in the production of that. Red ochre was a hugely significant color for our ancient ancestors all over Europe. They even sometimes used it to color the bones of their deceased loved ones. Although nobody knows why. Staying in England for a moment, King Henry V was enormously grateful for the assistance of the City of London during the Hundred Years' War. The city provided much of the financial assistance required to fight the Battle of Agincourt in France in 1415, leading to a crucial English victory and a long period of dominance in the war. 
The total amount that the city loaned to the king would be the equivalent of around $5 million in modern terms. When the battle was over, the king gave the city this stunning crystal scepter by way of thanks. He had it made especially for the occasion, employing the services of the finest English craftsmen of the era and forcing two French craftsmen to work with them. The gemstones used in its composition come from all over the world, including red spinels from Afghanistan and pearls from the Gulf of Arabia. By rights, the scepter should have been sold off along with the rest of the crown jewels under the puritanical reign of Oliver Cromwell in the 1650s, but the city's authorities kept it safe by hiding it from Cromwell's men. Thomas Becket was once the Archbishop of Canterbury in England, but fell out with King Henry II after a power struggle and was exiled and banished from his home country. He fled to Rome, but returned to Canterbury in 1170 and was promptly executed by the king's men as he stood at the altar in Canterbury Cathedral. Whether or not the king specifically ordered Becket's murder is unknown, but the killing sparked outrage and tainted the remainder of his reign, leading to the Great Revolt of 1173. Pope Alexander III greatly added to Henry's problems by declaring Becket to be a martyr and making him a saint. That declaration caused any item associated with Becket to be revered, including the bloody tunic he was wearing at the time of his murder. History doesn't record who stripped it from Becket's body or where it was kept in the immediate aftermath, but it was held within the archives of the Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore by 1485. It might have been given to the Pope by Henry VII many years earlier as he tried to make amends with Rome. The blood-stained garment was eventually sent back to Canterbury for the first time in 850 years for a special exhibition in November 2018. Mary Poppins isn't real, but if the famous character had a real-life inspiration, it was probably Emily Ward. She founded the Norland College for Nannies in 1892, and the institution went on to provide many of the nannies that were hired by oligarchs, monarchs, and the super-rich all over Europe. She also penned an advisory manual for her first students when her college opened. 125 years later, in 2017, the only known surviving copy of the manual was found in an attic in a forgotten wing of the college building in Bath, Somerset, England. It seems that Ward also used the manual as a diary, writing in it regularly from May 1892 until November 1919. The contents of the book lay out a few of the college's principles, including the idea that a nurse or nanny works with a mother rather than for her or instead of her. Ward also wrote a list of target customers, ranging in location from nearby Chelsea to Manchester in the north of England and even as far away as Moscow, Russia. The college still exists today and is modernized over the course of the past century, but its basic framework is all laid down in the delicate pages of this book. Respect for the rule of law is one of the most important and fundamental aspects of maintaining a civilized society. Coming up with a code of laws is a vital step in the foundation of any country or culture, but it might surprise you to hear how old the concept is. This is the Code of Hammurabi, named for King Hammurabi of Babylonia, who reigned almost 3,800 years ago. It's considered to be the oldest complete set of laws and legal principles in the world, and is still greatly admired by lawyers of the modern era. The steel of Hammurabi, sometimes also known as the Louvre steel, is the basalt block upon which the 282 laws are written. The text covers everything from basic civil laws to acceptable commercial practices and includes set fines and punishments for specific offenses. Written in Akkadian, the prelude to the text states that the code is designed to protect the weak from oppression by the strong. A recurring theme is that someone has the right to be considered innocent until proven guilty, a principle that remains true in most countries today. The steel was stolen by the forces of Elamite king Shatrak Nahante about 3,200 years ago, but was rediscovered by a French mining engineer in 1901. 
We often think of prenuptial agreements as a conceit of the modern age and as cynical documents that convey a lack of faith from both parties involved that their marriage will stand the test of time. In reality, though, there's nothing new about the idea of a prenup. Here's an eight-foot-long one from ancient Egypt to prove it. It's currently on display at the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago and is 2,480 years old. As one might expect from a document so ancient, the text is full of unusual clauses. One is that a husband must promise his wife an annual recompense of 12 pieces of silver and 36 bags of grain for the rest of her life if he divorces her. As a show of her faith, though, a woman must pay her husband 30 pieces of silver up front when marrying him. There are even get-out clauses for ending the marriage amicably in the event that it fails to produce children. Husbands were permitted to keep concubines, but none were afforded any of the rights given to the wife in the marriage contract. Failure to adhere to the terms of the agreement constituted a criminal offense, and a jury trial would be arranged. Concubines aside, it's really not so different from a modern prenup. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.